Respected viewers, brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to the final night with Dr. Sayyid Ammar Naqshawani. Before I introduce everything, I would like to congratulate you as well as congratulate to everyone across the world, especially the Imam of our time. May Allah hasten his reappearance and the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them all. For the birth anniversary of the second Imam of Ahlul Bayt, alayhim salam, Imam Al Hassan Askari, peace and blessings be upon him. Now we are here in Karbala, and before I say anything, I would like to thank you very much for your enthusiastic comments, for your enthusiastic participation in our show. Your questions were very beneficial. It was an amazing show that I had, a, a huge experience I had uh, with Sayyid Ammar al uh, And before we get into the happy moments, uh, yesterday, something a few hours ago, uh, something very tragic happened in Karbala, uh, a bomb blast, uh, a suicide bomber, uh, did blow up himself, uh, you know, in, early in the morning. Uh, where you know it's 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 sad to see that people are still ignorant uh, at this time. But the second Imam of Ahlul Bayt, alayhim salam, Imam Al Hassan Al Mushtaba, peace and blessings be upon him. Not too much credit has been given to him. A huge disservice has been done to this Imam, the second Imam of Ahlul Bayt, in the idea that he has not been given the credit he deserves within the autobiographies of the Imam and the literature and the Islamic literature. When we look at the literature, we see many written about the other Imams, Imam Hassan al-Mujtaba has been always neg been neg neglected as he is one of the master of the youth of paradise. And since we are in Karbala near his two beloved brothers, Imam al Hussein and al-Abbas, peace be upon them both, we have dedicated tonight's episode, the first half of tonight's episode to talk about his life and the second half for general Q&A. General Q&A are longer than usual. They're about 30 to 35 minutes. Uh, so we will get to answer more questions and receive more calls. So don't forget to send in whatever you have or call. Sayyidina, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as I would like to congratulate you. Thank you so much. Thank Sayyidina, you. It's, it's been an honor to have you on the show. Thank you. Uh, to host. Uh, and you know, we have the long shot and both of us are wearing this dasha. Uh, yeah, I think, I think we look like two bottles of milk. Uh, <laughs> So we're just and saying. probably I look as, uh, as, uh, as religious as anyone at the moment. About time I look quite religious as well in the, in the media. So uh, I'm, very, I'm very honored to be dressed with this 7th century clothing at the moment. Inshallah. Now Sayyidina, why has been Imam al-Hassan uh, al-Mushtaba, peace and blessings be upon him, been depicted in a negative view? People always don't even, don't even talk about him, or when they do talk about him, they mention something either negative or talk such little. Why? There's so many angles in which one could answer this question about the glorious grandson of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his yes. family. I think if you're looking at an angle from within the school of Ahlul Bayt السلام, in many cases he's overshadowed by the wonderful exploits of his brother on the 10th of Muharram yes. and this is only natural considering that we find that we dedicate many days of majalis to Imam Al Hussein السلام, and only a couple of days of the year to Imam Al Hassan السلام. I remember when I was the resident alim of the Haider Islamic Center in London, we had made it a point that instead of having one night for Imam Al Hassan alayhi salam, mm -hmm. we should try and have a few more nights, three nights, five nights. Nice. And the intention, inshallah, one day is to have ten nights on Imam Al Hassan alayhi salam. Hopefully. In the same way, we dedicate ten nights to Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam. Yes. So, from within our communities, naturally, Muharram and the wonderful bravery and valor and discipline of Aba Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam meant that there was less discussion on Imam al Hassan alayhi salam. Another angle why Imam al Hassan alayhi salam is not necessarily seen with the greatest light is because the Abbasids had a severe hatred not just for the sons of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam but also for the sons and grandsons of Imam al Hassan alayhi salam. Yes. There were a number of the grandsons of Imam al Hassan alayhi salam who fought Banu Abbas, mm -hmm. who stood up against Banu Abbas, who revolted against Banu Abbas. When Banu Abbas had much of the Islamic literature and the scribes under their control, 
it meant that they were going to target their attack, not just on the Talibids, but they were going to target their attack on the grandsons of Imam al Hassan, as well as eventually targeting a vicious attack on Imam al Hassan alayhi salam himself. Yes. If they saw Nafs al Zakiya, or they saw Abdullah, the son of Hassan al Muthanna, or they saw others who revolt against them, therefore they would want to try and attack the character of the man who these people all descend from. Mm -hmm. Thirdly, if you're looking from another angle, a third angle, people revere politicians who are corrupt, leaders who are full of deceit and bribery, yes. and they sincerely believe in a worldview where the means justifies the ends. Yes. On the contrary, in the school of Ahlul Bayt, we pride ourselves on the piety and the dignity of the Imams. We don't believe in this idea that the means justifies the ends and therefore Absolutely. our Imams should be bribing people or be corrupt or be deceitful to their community. Yes. Therefore you'll find that some Orientalists mm -hmm. will look at the skirmishes and the battles between Muawiyah and Imam al Hassan alayhi salam. And when they look at them, they say, well, look at Muawiyah. Muawiyah's governance is a governance to revere. They don't care if there's a corruption or a deceit. Mm -hmm. The fact is that they say, Imam al Hassan alayhi salam, politically for them, that's ineptness. For us, that is the maintaining of one's patience and dignity yes. for the sake of the religion of Islam. So there's a number of reasons why we've neglected, but there's no doubt in our communities, more people know about the life of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. And when I say the life, I think the last couple of months of his life, yeah. then they do about Imam al Hassan alayhi salam. And I was inspired myself on a personal level when I had gone with my father to Jannat al Baqi. Mm -hmm. And I remember everyone in Jannat al Baqi crying, and I wasn't crying. And it was simply because I did not know much about Imam al Hassan alayhi salam. Had I known more about Imam al Hassan alayhi salam, that would have had a dramatic effect on my moment in Jannat al Baqi. When I returned, I decided that I want to read more about Imam al Hassan. And when you read about Imam al Hassan alayhi salam, there is a wonderful, wonderful biography which a person can learn so many lessons from, no yes. doubt. Mm -hmm. Now, I, one of your lectures, I think it was uh, about. Lady Maksuma, where you spoke about naming your children and the significance, uh, along with psychology, as proven right now, naming your child a name has a huge effect on their personality. Now, who named Mawal Hassan? And what were some of the incidents that happened uh, during that time? Well, he is born, as we remember today, on the 15th of Ramadan. Yes. The 15th of the holy month of Ramadan and the third year after Hijrah. You find that with the naming of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt Imam al Hassan, Imam al Hussein. Yes. When they ask Imam Ali, what should we name your newborn son? He says, it's not for me to decide. It's for the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family. Mm -hmm. When they come to the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, he says, it's not for me to decide. It's for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to name him. So divinely. Divinely named. And this should give us an understanding. That when later on you're uncertain when Muawiyah and Hassan come together in war, one who's named by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the yes. other who's named by a bloodthirsty cannibal, one whose name means goodness, the other whose name means a barking female dog, you'll see the difference between the two. So when it comes to Imam al Hassan alayhi salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who names him yes. Hassan. Previous to that, none of the Arabs were called Hassan. You might have had the odd Hassan, for example. But Hassan, Barely. nobody was named Hassan. There was a mountain that was called Hassan. But in terms of the Arab population, no one was given the name Hassan. Mm -hmm. And his birth brought a joy to the heart of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, because that's the first grandchild. The first grandchild of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family. Now, there are certain ceremonies which are associated with the birth of Imam al-Hassan alayhi salam, which I believe 
have an effect on your child's upbringing. Number one, one of the rights of your child is you give them a good name. Yes. So straight away, the Ahlul Bayt make sure that they don't give some random name. Yeah. They don't give a name simply to fit into the society of the time. That how yeah. can my non-Muslim friends think that we're cool? Or how can they, for example, say that these people are fitting into our culture? Yes. No. Hassan is a wonderful name. And these are the type of words that would be used by Nabi Adam alayhi salam when he's asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what? For, for what? forgiveness. In the famous incident, Ya Allah, bihaqqi Muhammad wa antal Mahmood, wa bihaqqi Ali wa antal A'la, wa bihaqqi Fatima wa anta Fatir al-Samawat wa al-Ard, wa bihaqqi al-Hasan wa antal Muhsin, wa bihaqqi al-Husayn wa anta Qadim al-Ihsan. You find that therefore this name, number one, the Ahlul Bayt make sure that the right of your child is not just that you name them, you give them a good name. The Arabs, you know what they're naming. Yeah. They used to give some ridiculous names. Weird names. There was a guy who came to the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family, and he said to him, and the Prophet asked him, what's your son's name? He said, Shaitan. Wow. He had called his son Shaitan. Wow. Now I know the son may have, listen, if the son turns out to act like Shaitan later on, you can't blame the boy because the boy is going to turn around and say, you name me Shaitan. Yeah. Then you have, for example, others would name their son Jinn or Abd al-Shar. The Arabs, you know, what? the servant of evil. Imagine calling your son, hey, servant of evil, come here. Wow. Quran would mention Surah Al-Hujurat. Bi'sa al-usmu al fusuq ba'd al-Iman. The worst of these names is with the people and should be changed after belief has come to them. Yes. So you find the naming. You find as well, today many people ask about the haqiqa ceremony. When they ask about Allah, the haqiqa ceremony yeah. and you've got a child, yeah. And I'm sure you remember that ceremony. There are certain mustahab acts that we have on the basis of the way Abu Talib and what he did at the birth of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and then Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa what he did at the birth of Imam al-Hassan and Imam al-Hussein alayhi wa mm -hmm. You have, for example, in our traditions, a number of different acts that it's recommended and look, you don't have to perform all of them at the same time. Like, well, you know, one of them is put Zafaran or Saffron on the head of the baby. Yeah. You've got to be quite wealthy to be pouring, you know, Saffron on someone's head that easily. You have other traditions that talk, for example, later on the Imams would put, uh, let's say, a piece of the, of the clay of Imam al Hussein, a small, small amount. You've got, for example, some who used to take from the water of the Furat. But with the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family, you've got the Adhan in the right ear. You've got the iqama in the left ear. left ear. You've got, for example, those who mention the shaving of the head of the baby. You've got, for example, those who will give food away to the neighbors. Yes. And it's detested that those, you know, that the mother or the father or the members of the family eat, but that you give the food towards the neighbors. And that these sacrifices are meant to be a protection mm -hmm. for that baby who's born. Thirdly, it's interesting that when the Imams of Ahlul Bayt السلام, were asked, how can we, for example, prevent our children by being afflicted with evil eye? Mm -hmm. a lot, yeah, a lot of people ask that. They would reply with the dua that Rasulullah recited when Imam Al-Hassan was born. And when Rasulullah was asked, what is this dua? He said the same dua that Ibrahim recited when Ismail and Ishaq were born. And the dua is available within our books of literature. Where can we find that dua? You can find it if you're looking within Ibn Tawus or Kaf Hami or Shaykh Al-Tusi within the works. You'll find that the supplication of the newborn. And that is where you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect that baby from the evil eye of the people. Because you know, Al Ain Haq. Yes. Al-Ayna Haqq means that the eye is a reality, it's a truth. Therefore, all of these ceremonies, but when you see Imam Al-Hassan born, you see a joy which fills the heart of the Prophet, peace be upon his family. Yes. Imam Al-Hussein, when he's born, there's more of a, a heaviness in the heart of Rasulullah. Yes. But with Imam Al-Hassan, there's a joy that encompasses the whole family. Mm -hmm. Now, speaking of his grandfather, Rasulullah, um, how was the relationship? I know his first grandson ever, 
after losing so many sons and getting Fatima Zahra and then getting Amr Hassan. How was his relationship with his grandson? Oh, it was, a, it was an amazing relationship. And, uh, and Rasulullah begins to break stereotypes of the ways the Arabs are with their children. You know, Arabs, some of them can be very cold with their children, you know, with, especially with the boys. Because they say that by us being cold, or by us not hugging them, or by us not, for example, playing with them, they turn out to be men. They turn out to be men. Yeah. There was a guy by the name of Al Agra. Al Agra, the bald. The bald guy. Al Agra looked at the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family, hugging Imam Al Hassan alayhi salam. And, and Al Agra is like, to the Prophet, peace be upon his family, you hug your kids. And he's like, yeah. yeah. And then Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, tells him, you don't hug yours? He goes, no. I got 10 children, I don't hug them. Wow. And the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, begins to notice that there needs to be a change in the compassion and the warmth one displays with their kids. Yes. He'll call out, where is the flower of my eye, wow. Al Hassan bin Ali, alayhi salam. Not just, the flower of my heart or the apple of my eye, not just where is Hassan or bring me Hassan. No, I want the flower of my heart, the apple of my eye. So you find this tenderness in Rasulullah. He'd play with them. He'd make sure that even if they are to ride on top of him, you know, your father, when he acts, for example, with your kid mm -hmm. as a granddad, and he'll let the kid sit on the back. And the people would look at the young Imam al Hassan and they'll say, What an honor it is for you to sit on the back of Rasulullah. And Rasulullah would turn around and say, No, on the contrary. The honor is for me that he is the one wow. who is sitting on the back. So you found that Rasulullah slowly in his acts with Imam al Hassan alayhi salam slowly begins to instill a compassion towards kids that hitherto to that point was not really seen in. Arabian society. Mm -hmm. Now, another incident that uh, Imam al-Hassan was a part of was the incident of Kisa, Hadith al-Kisa. Now, when did this happen and why is it so significant? Well, you're looking at happening when he is, you know, only in and around the age of five. Yes. Um, and his brother, who is a year younger than him, at the age of four, around that time. And this is a monumental incident. It's in Sunni and Shia literature. Yes. Um, in Sunni literature, Aisha, the wife of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, and Um Salama, the wife of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, both narrate the incident in relation to that Yemeni cloak where Fatima al Zahra and the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, Imam al Hassan, Imam al Hussein, and Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib all gather under this cloak, mm -hmm. and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals the eye of the Quran. Chapter 33, verse 33 of the Holy Quran. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states that He keeps away all impurities from Al Muhammad and purifies them, a thorough purification. This shows you the spiritual purification yes. of Al Muhammad salam, and the reason why they are seen as infallible or one may define it as error free. Mm -hmm. But you see the tenderness in that house. The house with Jibra'il visits to reveal the verses of the Holy Quran. And not just the tenderness, the respect. I smell the fragrance of my father. Are you feeling well? Are you okay, my son? Are you okay, my grandson? Come hug me, come sit with me. There's a real warmth that whenever anyone reads Hadith al kisa you find a wonderful warmth that is there in that incident between them. But from a young age, you could see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already chosen these as the leaders for the Muslim community. Mm -hmm. Now, another incident uh, also mentioned, as you mentioned, in, in both Sunni and Shia literature is the incident of Mubahala. Now, according to Islamic literature, one of the most significant incidents that happened in Islamic history was Al-Mubahala. Now, was Imam al Hassan a part of that? How were they? Again, he's a part of this monumental incident, not only narrated in Shia narrations. There's a famous work called Tafsir al Jalalain mm -hmm. of Jalal al Din al Suyuti and Jalal al Din al Mahalli. Yes. It's a very famous 
Quran tafsir. And within there it mentions that when the Christians of Najran came to visit the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family, the Islamic State had now been established. And many of these Christians were wondering what's their position within the state now? Yes. Are they allowed to continue to worship in their churches? Or for example, is the now are they going to be forced to become Muslims? They've never met the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family. And the incident is narrated in the Quran from chapter 3, verse 59 to 61. Mm -hmm. What happens is that when the Christians meet the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, they ask him a number of questions. Yes. For example, they'll ask him, let's say, who's the father of Joseph? He'll say Jacob. Who's the father of Moses? Amran, for example. Who's your father? Abdullah. Who's Jesus' father? said he had no father they said then he must be the son of God he said no what about said why said if you're saying he must be the son of God because he had no father Adam had no father or no, no mother no mother exactly. and the Quran revealed the verse in the Isa and the Adam the similitude of Adam the similitude of Jesus similar to that of Adam Adam had no father, Adam had no mother, so who should be called the son of God, Adam or Jesus? When they, didn't, when they disagreed, something interesting happens because this incident occurs a year and a bit before the Prophet Muhammad dies. Peace mm -hmm. be upon his family. There's already 100,000 companions, he's married to a number of wives. And what's interesting is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders him when he notices that these people are not paying heed to what his arguments are. Allah says to him in chapter 3 verse 61 فَمَنْ حَاجَّكَ فِيهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَكَ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ فَقُلْ تَعَالَوْ نَدْعُوا أَبْنَانَا وَأَبْنَاءَكُمْ وَنِسَانَا وَنِسَاءَكُمْ وَأَنفُسَنَا وَأَنفُسَكُمْ ثُمَّ نَبْتَهِلْ فَنَجْعَلْ لَعْنَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَى الْكَاذِبِينَ Those who dispute with you after the knowledge has come to them Say to them, you bring your sons, we'll bring our sons you bring your woman, we'll bring our woman. You bring yourselves, we'll bring ourselves. And we'll invoke God to curse whoever's the liar. It's a big, big, big statement from the Quran. Huge statement. It's a year and a bit before the Prophet Muhammad dies. Peace be upon him and his family. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that when you're going to meet these Christians, this is a massive occasion. You're the Prophet of God. They're doubting you. Tell them, if you're so certain that I'm a liar, invoke God to curse me. And the Quran says, tell them, bring the best of your people, your sons, your women, yourselves, bring them all. The companions on the one hand are wondering, is it us he's going to take? Is it me? The wives are thinking, is it us? Because it says sons, it says women, it says yeah. selves. So if you're a companion and you're taken, you could be seen as the nafs of the Prophet, peace be upon him, his family. If you're a woman, you're a wife, you think, well, I could be one of those women. Yes. The sons, here's the question. Who is he going to take? No sons. Except grandsons. Excellent point. There's no sons at the time. The Christians say something interesting. If Muhammad brings his companions... He's not a prophet of God. If he brings his family, he's a prophet of God. And we, we will not debate him. Whether we believe in him is a different story. Mm -hmm. But we won't debate him. Why? A man who's willing to bring his family and lay them down for the sake of the religion is definitely a man of God. If he brings his companions, that's it. when he's willing to bring his own family, you know that man is willing to sacrifice everything. The community was all waiting. Who is he going to bring? Sons, he brings Imam al Hassan, Imam al Hussein. Wow. Salam. Imam al Hassan is six, Imam al Hussein is five at the time. Woman, he can bring so many. But none comes near the dust of Fatima al Zahra. Salam. He takes Fatima, his daughter. As himself, he has over 100,000 companions. But only one man could be known as the nafs of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And that's Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. Even I've seen in Sunni literature, yes. when they ask the question in Sunni literature, who's the best after the Prophet, Masha Abu Bakr, and then Umar, then Uthman, how about Ali? 
And the reply is, Ali min nafs the Rasul. Ali is from the self of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family. Wow. Therefore, when you're taking your sons here, you're saying Hassan and Hussein are not my grandsons. They are my sons. Don't look at them as my grandsons. That's how close they are to me. I who lost Qasim and Ibrahim and Tahir, these are my sons. Never ever later on say, Grandsons. Grandsons. You therefore find that this incident highlighted Imam al-Hassan Imam al-Hussein out of the whole Muslim community, at the age of six, at the age of five, they're able to represent the religion of Islam. Mm -hmm. Because when you're taking them to meet the Christian community, what are you saying? You're saying that I don't care this six or five. The moment Kisa happened, the moment Allah has designated them as the protectors of the religion. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you find that this is a monumental incident highlighting their position of leadership in early Islam. Mm -hmm. Another incident, that, a tragic incident that happened during the life of Imam al-Hassan, uh, you know, at a very young age, uh, he witnessed something tragic, the demise or martyrdom of his mother, Fatim Zahra, alayhi salam. And how did that affect him in any way? What was his relationship and his brother's relationship uh, with, with, uh, with their mother? I, I would say that they... They learned a lot of their principles from seeing their mother's behavior. Their father is a colossal human being anyway. Yes. And their father becomes someone they're attached to when they become orphaned at the tender age of eight and seven. Anyone who becomes an orphan at that young age, it's difficult. Eight years of age, Imam al-Hassan was when his mom died. But they used to see their mom pray in the darkness of the night. That affects their spirituality. They used to see their mom supplicate for the community ahead of themselves. Al-Jar, yes. Thumma al -dar. When they ask her mother, why the community first? Why are you praying for everyone else? The community, the neighbors, yeah. then us. Wow. One of the key reasons why our supplications are rejected in Islam is when we pray for ourselves and don't think of the community. Mm. Sometimes, I remember one person came to the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family. He said to him, Ya Rasulullah, my du'as are not being accepted. He said, you pray for others first, then yourself? He goes, no, I pray for myself. He said, oh. pray for others first. He goes, yes. okay. So this guy went away, he started shouting, Oh Allah, bless me, bless Muhammad and no one else. He said, no, 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 no. we don't mean it in that way. <laughs> no, a person should pray for others first. And others. Secondly, they're seeing their mothers stand against injustice. Yes. When she sees Fedak usurped from her. Yes. But more importantly for her, when she sees the rights of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib usurped from, her, yeah. from him, they see their mother's constant communication with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that wonderful tasbih known as the tasbih of Fatima. The rosary beard of Fatima the Zahra alayhi salam. Yes. Therefore, there's a major effect. And you could see that, you know, they wouldn't miss a meal without their mom. You know, when their mom says to Asma bint Umais in one narration of Fidda and another, when she says that, you know, make sure their food is ready for them. And if you don't hear me, then know I have passed away in that final moment. Yeah. And when they, when they come home and they're told that your food's ready, and the reply is, when do you... When have you known us to have a meal without our mother? That closeness, that bond. And even afterwards, Imam al Hassan is deeply affected by the loss of his mom. There are moments he remembers the way she was treated. But his dad is the one who holds fort. His dad is the one who becomes a father in more ways than one for these orphans at home. Because you've got an eight-year-old, a seven-year-old, a five-year-old, a one-year-old. All of them are within the house. It's a very difficult time. But then their father ensures that they are brought up in the best environment possible. Gives everything away for them to be happy in their lives. Mm -hmm. Now before we go into the general Q&A, there's one more aspect that's always not looked at when we talk about Imam Hassan alayhi salam. A lot of people think he's a man, sits at home. I read it in literature, he's a man that likes women and you know, does, likes a lot of stuff. He's, he's a subtle man. There's no bravery in his life, there's no courage in his life. 
is that true? Was he brave? After Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, the bravest warrior in Islamic history is Imam al-Hassan. How come no one mentions it? The books mention him. Well, if, the, if, the, if the preacher or the speaker not, yeah. or the people aren't bothered to read, That's the yeah. books mention him. A colossal figure at Jamal and Safin. Was he there? He's alongside his father and he virtually is commander of the army. And at one stage, his father has to pull him back at Jamal and send others simply because his father wants to look out for the future of the leadership of the religion of Islam. But you look at his performance at Jamal and Safin, nobody could come near him. Nobody could kill an Imam of Ahl al-Bayt on the battlefield unless you do the cowardly act of getting thousands of you against one of them and deprive them of water and massacre their kids. Only then, with all of that, you just about managed to kill Imam al Hussein salam with half of them running away scared. Imam al Hassan's bravery is unique. Well, my dear brother Ahmed, understand bravery is not when a person simply picks up a sword and exactly. uses it. Exactly. It's also sometimes when you can do something but you decide to hold back. His grandfather, the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family, why does he call them the masters of the youth of paradise? Why? Why does he say they are imams, whether they are sitting or standing? Why? It's because his father knows that every, his grandfather knows that every decision they'll make is like my decision. At Hudaybiyah, when all the companions were telling me, fight the Quraysh, did I fight? Of course not. Therefore, when he signs a treaty, many will say, why is he not fighting? Don't come and attack my grandson. Come talk to me. Wow. That when I signed the Hudaybiyah Treaty, why were you all silent? But if anyone imagines Imam al Hassan on the battlefield, go read the annals of Jamal and Safin and see Imam al Hassan's bravery. Imam al Hassan was not scared of anyone out there. Mm -hmm. Now, Sayyidina, uh, we have come to the conclusion of the first part. We're going to go into general QA, but after this short break, so respective viewers, do stay tuned for you will be presented with live footages from inside the two holy shrines. Do keep in mind to congratulate the two kings on the birth anniversary uh, of their brother and do not forget to request from them your hajat, your requests uh, for surely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts the dua under the dome of these two holy shrines. So we'll be back shortly. شناهای عبد گنهکار یا مجیب مشکل گشاهای هرچه گرفتار یا مجیب مشکل گشاهای هرچه گرفتار یا مجیب از بس که تو ندیده گرفتی گناه من بر معصیت نمود ام اصرار یا مجیب سیت نمود ام اسرار یا مجیب سبحانک یا الله تعالیت یا رحمان اجرنا من النار یا مجیب اجرنا من النار یا مجیب می ترسم می ترسم از قیامت و از دوری حسین برگ امان برگ امان به من بده از نار یا مجیب برگ امان برگ امان به من بده از نار یا مجیب تا کربلای حضرت اربا پرکشم با یک سلام لحظه افتار یا مجیر با یک سلام لحظه افتار یا کربلای حضرت ارباب پرکشم با یک 
یک سلام لحظه افتاد یا مجیر با یک سلام لحظه افتاد یا Respected viewers, welcome back. Hope you, inshallah, took the opportunity to send your salutations upon the two kings and welcome back to our show with Dr. Sayyid Amar and Naqshawani. Uh, we do congratulate you once again and congratulate everyone, especially the man of our time and the Ahl al-Bayt, for this very auspicious occasion, which marks the birth anniversary of Imam al-Hassan al-Mushtaba. Peace and blessings be upon him. Now, this segment is general Q&A, uh, so where, where we ask your questions that you have sent in to Sayyid Ammar. Welcome back, Hayyid Sayyidina. Thank you, Habib. Allah Sayyidina. Now, Sayyidina, final night. Want to go all out. We want to talk about uh, a lot of stuff. Sure. Uh, but before we do that, um, a question that I got is regarding his wives. Amal Hassan is known to marrying a lot of wives. Uh, so, can you talk about his wives a little? Well, this myth about him marrying many wives is a myth which the Abbasids made up made up, they concocted this myth to try and destroy his reputation. Mind you, someone might point to the fact that within our own literature, mm -hmm. they might point to a tradition where, for example, Imam Ali says, do not marry your daughters to my son, Hassan. And someone might turn around and say, well, even Imam Ali is admitting, alayhi salam, that because Imam al Hassan is a habitual divorcee, you shouldn't marry your daughters to him. No. Wow. Certain people wanted to get married to Imam al Hassan simply because they wanted a child who would be a grandson of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family. That's all. So, those who try and throw you that tradition, be careful. The Abbasids are the ones who try to distort the image of Imam al Hassan simply because of their animosity to the grandsons of Imam al Hassan. There were constant revolts against Imam al Hassan, against the Abbasids from the grandsons of Imam al Hassan. When we look at the marriages of Imam al Hassan, السلام, there are notable names of ladies who he married. You have, for example, of those who are mentioned. You have, for example, Um Ishaq bin Talha, who, when Imam al Hassan dies, goes on to marry Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Yes. You have Ju'ada, the daughter of Al Ash'af bin Qais, who is known eventually as the lady who poisons him from the poison that was sent by the Umayyads to kill the grandson of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family. Mm -hmm. Therefore, you find that these are the notable names that are mentioned alongside others when it comes to the wives of Imam al-Hassan alayhi salam. Mm -hmm. Now, we do have a call from Brother Ali uh, from Germany. Salamun alaikum. Salamun alaikum, Brother Ahmad. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. I'm one of your Afghani spectators watching this nice show. During the last 40 nights, and I want to thank you guys for your nice program. Thank you so thank much. You, thank, thank you, you very much. Um, yeah, and I'm hoping your daughter, which uh, Sayyid will know for sure as a football fan. Say that again, sorry. If you can speak up a little bit. Sure. Uh, I hope it's better now. Yeah, it's just a bit louder, please. Say that again. Sure. Yeah, my question is regarding the act of mutu'a. Sorry? My question is regarding the act of mutua. Ah, I'm okay. Yes. Um, some of my friends use it to fulfill their sexual needs, especially with girls of Christian faith or non-believers. Um, to some of our Sunni brothers or sisters, this act is often criticized as using a backdoor to commit sinna. What is the exact ruling on mutua? Can it be misused as stated just for sexual intercourse? Or is it, uh, that, uh, or is it exactly that purpose? And secondly, to what extent are Muslim male and females equal for this act of mut'a? Yeah, yeah, the question, is, you, uh, the question is one of a very controversial nature. Yes. 
Um, you know, sadly, our communities do not discuss this question very often because of its taboo. Mut'a is translated in the English language with the word temporary marriage. Yes. For those who say that people are just using it for sexual enjoyment, that was the exact original purpose for this marriage. Purely the fulfillment of sexual desires. And if our Sunni brothers and sisters want to say that the Shia are abusing Mut'a, or the Shia have this temporary marriage called Mut'a, then they should read within their Sahah, the literature, where the companions of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, are away from their homes, and they want to fulfill their desires. They tell the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, should we castrate ourselves? And he replies to them, no. Engage in a temporary marriage even for a few days. Therefore, those who say, how comes the Shia Mut'a? Shia are not the ones who are Mut'a. Islam had temporary marriage. Isn't it mentioned in the Quran? It's mentioned, as I said, in chapter 4, verse 24 of the Holy Quran. فَمَسْتَمْتَعْتُمْ بِهِ مِنْ هُنَّ You find as well that it's mentioned as part of the religion of Islam and its teachings. Mm -hmm. Some say that it was prohibited, for example, mm -hmm. on the day of Ghaybar. But the eating of garlic was also prohibited on the day of Khaybar. Uh -huh. But many Muslims think of garlic. So now, that means that garlic must have had a temporary ban. Mut'a might have had a temporary ban for the soldiers at Khaybar. But later on in Hunayn, and after Hunayn, you find that it's allowed. Umar ibn al-Khattab, the second caliph, is the one who banned mut'a and prohibited mut'a. And Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, replies back to this by saying that if Umar had not banned Mut'a, there would not be adultery in this earth except from the most evil of people. Mm -hmm. The Imams of Ahlul Bayt السلام, have numerous traditions where they say Mut'a is permissible but with conditions. Yes. These legal conditions have to be met. Yeah. And these legal conditions can all be found within the jurist text. Today in our Sunni brothers world of law, you have the marriage of Urfi or the marriage of Misyar, which you can look up on Google if you want. These are all marriages which are different from the permanent marriage. Some are travel marriages, some are marriages to get to know one another. Therefore, those who are complaining about Mut'a, if you agree with Omar's prohibition, then go ahead. But we do not take Omar's prohibitions in our school. Mm -hmm. Now we do have uh, another call from uh, the UK. Salaamun Alaikum. Wa Alaikum Salaam. Are you welcome to the show? Uh, I have a question for Sayyid Amar. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, um, I just have a general question about uh, the historical figure of Abdullah ibn Sabah. Um, I just wanna, just wondering, uh, is he a real character? Is he not a real character? Uh, you know, um, is who is he if he's not a real character? Uh, a bit on his life story if he exists. And also, uh, the story of Imam Ali burning the man uh, is this uh, legit story. And would Imam Ali ever uh, kill someone to what seems like quite a cruel way? And also, we just had an election uh, last night in the United Kingdom. And uh, I was just wondering if Sayyid Amal was. Uh, you know, in regards to the state of the UK community after this election, is he optimistic or what does he feel about the election? Uh, sorry, that's a bit personal. Uh, I know not everyone likes to comment on elections and stuff like that, but um, I was just wondering, really, from someone that I listen to quite a lot. So, uh, thanks if you could answer that. Sure, I have a lecture on Abdullah bin Sabah, the person who was seen as being the Yemeni Jew who supposedly started Shiism. Mm -hmm. Shi'i thought is the earliest theology in the religion of Islam. I would say that Shi'i thought and the thought of the Khawarij is much earlier than Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. And I could discuss this in numerous lectures to show the points why. Mm -hmm. But certainly was not started by Abdullah bin Saba, the Yemeni Jew. Mm -hmm. Those who say it's Saif bin Umar's concocted character, others who say that there was a person by the name of Abdullah bin Saba, and a person who used to deify Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, believe that he, and believe that he is God. As I said in that lecture, I try and show the many reasons why this person is a mythical character, and the reason that they try to put him into the annals of Islamic history, mm -hmm. 
to try and plug the gap as to why the companions hated each other in early Islam. Mm -hmm. Clearly the companions in the first 25 years of the original Islam despised each other. You've got Ammar bin Yasser, Ali ibn Abi Talib, salam, others on one side of an army. Talha, Zubair, Amr ibn al-As, Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, others on another side of an army. This whole myth of the companions all being best friends with one another is one that has been spread far and wide. The moment that you show that they all fought each other, then they say, well, these are human beings and they're liable to mistakes. Mm -hmm. Now, fighting Ali ibn Abi Talib and then massacring thousands of people, I don't know if, if the Muslim finds that as a mistake. Actually, I'm not surprised when I see the behavior of Muslims in the world today. Nothing surprises me anymore when people just say that thousands dying is just a mistake. Wow. But then to plug that gap, you throw a Yemeni Jew. Muslims love to blame everything on the Jewish community. So you throw a Yemeni Jew in the mix. He said, that's the guy who caused all the trouble. Wow. Shia thought does not need Saif bin Omar's mythical character for its principles and its pillars. Mm -hmm. When you have Baqir al-Uloom and you have Ja'far al-Sadiq, salawatullah wa salamu alayhima, when you have them ensuring that the crystallization of what was taught by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family, Imam Amir al-Mu'mini, Imam al-Hassan, Imam Hussain, Imam al-Abideen, and crystallized and structured by Imam al-Baqir, Imam al-Sadiq, there was no Yemeni Jew who interfered. Mm -hmm. Secondly, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib's decisions on any punishments are not to be compared with the decisions of fallible figures. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, whatever he decides, is a decision on behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and is never an error free, is never a decision which is what? Which is an error. It's always a decision which is a decision in line with the teachings of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family. But one thing you do find with Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam is that he'll always try and give benefit of the doubt to those who are accused of something or even those who have admitted what they've done. Mm -hmm. So therefore, when you're studying these areas, do not compare him to others whose knowledge of the religion was fickle, but whose political Arab Bedouin tribalistic ways overtook them. Mm -hmm. Now, we do have another call from Sister Layla uh, from Lebanon. Salamu alaikum. Sister Layla from uh, Lebanon, Salamu Alaikum. Hello, Salamu Alaikum. Wa Alaikum Salam, Rahmatullah. Ramadan Mubarak, uh, Fariu Haj Ahmad, and Sayyid Ammar for all Shia. Thank you. And, Thanks, uh, Layla. Thank you very much. Sure, go ahead. Go ahead, sister. My question is that uh, uh, sometimes we pray and we make dua for God for something we need, uh, for something we want. My question is that. If uh, uh, all these du'as happen uh, for me, for example, my life is good, uh, everything is good, I have to worry about this uh, because God is giving me all I want uh, or uh, I have to be happy. Always I pray, I fast, I go to Ziyara, I make all things that God uh, 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 said to us to do, to do that. Do I have to worry about that, that everything is happening? Thank you, Layla. Well, Layla, I, I want to know which du'a you're reciting, if you could pass it on over here. My uh, football club hasn't won the Premiership for 27 years, and, and we could use your du'a for Liverpool Football Club, if you don't mind. Um, but on a serious note, if you yourself are having all your du'as being accepted, then this is a wonderful blessing in your life. It's nothing to worry about. Don't, don't bring you know, bad luck unto yourself. On the contrary, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said in the Quran, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي فَإِنِّي قَرِيبٌ أُجِيبُ دَعْوَةَ الدَّاعِ إِذَا دَعَانِي So if my servant asks you about me, tell them I am near. I'll answer the supplication of the supplicant when they supplicate towards me. Naturally, there are certain things that stop our dua from being accepted. Accepted, for example, Backward. our sins. Allahumma khfirli the nubal lati tahbisu dua Oh Allah forgive me the sins that block my dua For example not praying for others and yes. just praying for ourselves as we mentioned, as mentioned For example yeah. not beginning a, a dua with salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad And sometimes even those who may be opposite to Layla Layla is that blessed person who's getting all one her of, supplications accepted One of the accepted. luckiest persons Unbelievable <laughs> But 
if you're not as blessed as Layla, sometimes Allah SWT, you're thinking he's not answering my dua, I'm someone who's cursed. No, sometimes he's not answering your supplication because what you think is good for you, your Lord's telling you, just be careful that you think something's good for you is going to turn out bad for you. Mm -hmm. And if you trust that Allah is the Lord of wisdom, then definitely whatever he gives you in life is something that is full of wisdom and mercy. And whatever he takes from you is full of mercy and whatever. So, with Layla's situation, you should feel honored. Continue doing what you're doing because you found the secret recipe. Mm -hmm. And do send us the, the dua because we need it ASAP. Uh, and we have Brother Haider from Pakistan. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum, Sayyid Amai. How are you? Wa alaikum assalam. Very well, thank you. Uh, sorry, I'm a little bit nervous right now. No, go ahead. Um, uh, can you please discuss about the, the sons of Imam Ali named Abu Bakr bin Ali, Omar bin Ali, and Osman bin Ali? I wanted to ask what was the background of Imam Ali naming his sons after the three caliphs? And uh, was this before these three persecuted Imam Ali and usurped his right? Also, can we as Shia name our sons uh, uh, after these three caliphs? Please explain. That's a commonly asked question. Imam Ali ibn Abi yeah. Talib did not name his sons after Abu Bakr, Umar, and Uthman. Yeah. When he names his son Umar, for example, it's after Umar bin Muqrin, yes. the son of Umm Salama, who he used to love. When he names the son Uthman, it's after Uthman bin Mad'un. Yes. Mu'jam al thuqat has over 60 companions of Ahl al Bayt who have the names Umar or Uthman. Uthman is one of the deputies of the 12th Imam, Imam the four yes. deputies, one of yes. them is Uthman. Yes. My dear brother, it's not in the name. The names are important. Yes. But the Ahlul Bayt, when they are asked about Umar or Uthman and the naming of the son of, for example, Umm al-Banin called Uthman, they say this after Uthman bin Mad'un. I asked the question, did any of the caliphs name their children after the Ahlul Bayt Did, for example, Abu Bakr or Umar or Uthman, look at the names of their sons. Any of them named Hassan or Hussein or Ali Absolutely. or Fatima? Absolutely. But let's not get boggled down into debates on names. Exactly. Because when you're going on to names, now you're going into, you know, really weak arguments, mm -hmm. you know, to try and prove love and so on. Mm -hmm. um, listen, we've got companions of Ahl al who are great companions who are called Muawiyah. Or you have someone who's the son of Yazid, Jabir bin Yazid al Jafi, Muawiyah bin Wahab. Yes. Uthman bin Sa'id when mm -hmm. it comes to the 12th Imam. It's not about the names. Rather, you can find a reasoning why the Ahlul Bayt have named them after great people who had those names. Mm -hmm. Yep. Now, uh, we have one of the questions. Uh, did Imam Al Hassan have any children in Karbala and how did they represent him? Yeah, he had, he had seven sons at Karbala. Seven? Seven sons. Six of them were killed. Only Qasim is mentioned. Qasim is the one mentioned mainly in the Masaib. Yeah. But there are other sons who are there present in Karbala. Mm -hmm. One of them, Abdullah ibn al Hassan, I will never forget. When he saw Harmal ibn Kahil about to shoot his arrow on the holy chest of Abu Abdullah when he was lying on the ground, and Abdullah ibn Hassan runs out of the tent to sit in the way of the chest of Imam al Hussein so the arrow hits him. And his aunt is saying, of course, I come back and says, How can I come back and my uncle is alone? The one who survived is known to be Hassan al-Muthanna. Mm -hmm. And then from there, you've got the continuation of the line of Imam al-Hassan mm -hmm. Where is his lineage today? Sarah asks. King of Morocco? Uh -huh. Is a Hassani Sayyid? And then you have, there are many Sadat who are Hassanis as well. Uh, one of the other questions uh, that we have is, what can we do to resort Baqiya? Yeah, it, it hurts, no doubt, when we see. But I don't think there's been an Imam of Ahl al-Bayt whose grave has not gone through a period of destruction or a period of oppressors surrounding it. No doubt. When you look, for example, Fatima Zahra alayhi salam, we don't know where her grave is. Imam Ali alayhi salam, 90 years, no one knew where his grave is. Imam al rada had oppression around his grave for years until now there are lovers. And you find the Imams of Jannat al baqi But people are working hard. There are mm -hmm. people who are working hard, organizations which are coming together. We should work with UNESCO and heritage organizations to restore that monumental graveyard in Medina. Mm -hmm. We do have another call from Sister Zahra. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Wa alaikum assalam. Wa alaikum assalam. Wa alaikum assalam. Wa alaikum assalam.
وعليكم السلام السلام عليكم سيد عمار وعليكم السلام زهراء um, I have a question regarding to yesterday's lecture Yeah, go ahead um, The fact that there's tafsir al-Quran um, from Ahl al-Bayt How can people take istikhara in the Quran and fassir it in their own way? Is that right? So just repeat it one more time. Can I didn't get that. that? Um, the fact that there's tafsir al Quran by Ahl al Bayt. Yes. How can people um, do istikhara, like take khira in the Quran and fassir the ayah in their own way? Is oh, that right? Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Thank you. Thank you. The, uh, when people do an istikhara, one of the ways, if you're not using the sibha, is that you're going, if you're not using the rosary bead, you're going to use the Quran. Quran. So when you open the Quran, remember, everyone's dad thinks they know the Quran inside out. So all our dads, my dad has the most unbelievable istikhara possible, wow. but others have, you know, they, they all believe in their istikhara. And they believe in the results of their istikhara. Now, when they come to an ayah, look, if you're doing an istikhara and the ayah comes out, Jahannam wa bi'sa al masir, oh. that is bad. <laughs> if the ayah comes out, Inna al abrara lafi na'im, that's good. That's good. Ayah comes out beginning a bit bad, then becomes good, then it's wasat. Today, what we have, great, is that there are ulama who have written the conclusion of that page because of the tafsir of Ahl al Bayt at the top of the page. Mm -hmm. So when you open the top of the page, it'll say khob, or it'll say bad, or it'll say wasat, or it'll say good. Or at the bottom of the page, because of the tafsir of Ahl al-Bayt salam, they've also written uh, why this side, if you open it, it's good. So the ulama have worked strenuously to help us with the Qur'an and having the result of an istikhara on them. Mm -hmm. Now we do have a sister from uh, Canada. Assalamu alaikum. Hello. Hello, assalamu alaikum. Welcome to the show. Hello, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Welcome to the show. I have a question about hijab when praying. Yes. Yes, go ahead. Yes, go ahead. Oh, Can you just move away from the TV, please? On TV. It's very nice for the live lectures. Thank you. So Thank you so much. Is, why do females wear, so the question is, why do females wear the hijab when praying at home by themselves with no one in the same room? Why do we have to wear full hijab when hijab was made for non-mahram men and God is not a non-mahram? Thank you so much, sister. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank yes. you so much, sister. Thank you so much for answering my question. There, there isn't a religion in the world that does not display extra modesty when in the presence of their Lord. Yes. If you look, for example, the Christian community, you could show me a lady who's on the catwalk in Milan for a big Italian designer. When she goes to church, all of a sudden, there's a nice black, even hijab, you could call it, on the top of her head, or let's say even a hat, out of reverence, not of the people, out of reverence of being in the presence of the Lord. Yes. If you say nudity is the complete disrespect, for example, or the complete lowest of the human being, then the highest is the complete covering and especially in the presence of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Recently, one of the biggest presidents in the world, his wife, came to Saudi Arabia, doesn't care. You know what, I don't need to wear a scarf. Okay, it's her personal choice. The moment she went to the Pope in the Vatican, it wasn't so much the Pope, it was that she is in a holy land and there was a reverence there. Mm -hmm. Likewise with us, when we come to our prayers, Men and women, there are laws of modesty yes. in front of the Lord that have to be observed. Yes. Now we do have a call from uh, Brother Abbas from Pakistan. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Hello, Assalamu alaikum. Can you speak a bit louder or move uh, away from the TV? Can you speak a bit louder? Or we try again? Try again. If you can try, uh, try to call again, uh, that, that would be great. Uh, another question that we have, why was uh, chapter 33 uh, named, let me just pull it out, chapter 33 named Al-Ahzab? Al-Ahzab refers to the confederations of the tribes. Yes. That all came together in the battle of Khandaq. 
to mm. fight the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family while he was in Medina. These tribes, whether it's Abu Sufyan and his group from Mecca, some of the Jewish tribes in Medina, and some of the hypocrites of Medina, all came together to try and form an alliance to once and for all destroy the spread of the religion of Islam. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's referring to these different alliance of groups and tribes. Mm -hmm. Now, Muhammad says, uh, Shia's but we'll take this call before we go back to the question. Assalamu alaikum, Sister Barak from Canada. Assalamu alaikum, brothers. God bless you for this great program. Sir, if you can sp speak a bit louder, is there something wrong with, with the speaker? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. God bless you both for this program and on these blessed nights. You as well. So my question is, Assalamu alaikum, Sayyid. So my question with the, in your opinion, um, the Muslim community more involved and aware about reaching out and getting help for those who are struggling, suffering from mental health struggles, especially when we have so much on and the hadith and riwayat on the ahl bayt to helping the self and the nafs. Um, so I'd like to know your thoughts on how we can get more. Uh, people to open up about that and to learn more about it and to use our own um, You could say our own psychology within our faith that we've had for 1400 years that only recently that people have been discovering So that we can reach out to those who are struggling alone and mm -hmm. I've asked you this question before in events And I was hoping that you could reach a wider audience so that we can get to those who uh, who can who can get help and not be ostracized and uh, separated because as we know a lot of um, these issues in our community it could also lead to isolation and people who could get help from perhaps uh, support networks and whatnot that are Islamic and could potentially get people to get to extremism as well. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much. Sayedna. Yes, Sister Barak and her team have been working tirelessly yes. in North America to try and make sure that people are aware that just because you have a mental health issue, it should not be an embarrassment for you to go and seek help. Yes. For many years, if we had a member of our family who had a mental health issue, you're worried that the community might find out. Forget the community. Look out for the care of your family members and the future of the health of your family members by looking for those people who are specialists in these areas. I believe the 21st century mosque should not just be made up of a jurist who heads the mosque, but also someone who's an expert in the medical field, the mental health field, the field of sports and fitness. All of these have to be different avenues where the 21st century mosque caters for them. Yes. We have to have a helpline, and not a six-hour helpline, a 24-hour helpline, where those who are suicidal, those who feel depressed, those who feel anguish or anxiety are able to call in are able to speak with someone. Sometimes a person just wants to hear another human being who can hear them out or the advice of another human being because of their loneliness and because of the trials and tribulations of this world. Mm -hmm. And we have some wonderful people who have studied psychology and people who are specialists in the world of psychiatry and others who are specialists in spiritual psychology as well. Hopefully we're able to empower them more so we don't hear of suicidal cases or hear of people who have been through difficulties and no one was there for them to reach out to. Mm -hmm. Great, great point, Sayyidina. Uh, now, uh, we have a question from Brother Muhammad. He says, uh, we Shias always uh, are you know, claimed to be mushriks because uh, of the saying by Imam Ali, I am the first and I am the last. What does Imam Ali mean in this? Imam al-Radha is asked when Imam Ali says that I am the first and I am the last. Yes. Is this not shirk from Imam Ali alayhi salam? Yeah. God is the first I and mean, God is the last. Yeah. When Imam Ali says he is the first and the last, firstly Imam Ali would never commit shirk. The Kaaba opened itself for him to be born in it. You don't need to teach Ali ibn Abi Talib about exactly. Tawheed. Exactly. But secondly Imam al-Radha answers wonderfully. He says, Imam Ali says, I am the first and I am the last meaning. I was the first to join the call of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa mm -hmm. 
and I was the last to see the Prophet when he passed away. Mm -hmm. There is absolutely no problem in that interpretation. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, now we have uh, Sister Kanzai uh, from uh, Pakistan. Salaamu Alaikum. Wa Alaikum Salaam. Salaamu Alaikum Sayyid. Wa Alaikum Salaam wa Rahmatullah. My question is regarding saying the Savior of Imam then why it is referred to help the chapter of Holy Quran in many Nohas, the Eulogies? Why is what? Sorry, just repeat that one more time. Can you repeat that? Surah Kahf is related to Imam Sivir. Why is Surah Al Kahf Hussain? related to Imam Al Hussein? Alayhi salam? Why is Surah Al Kahf related to Imam Al Hussein? Alayhi salam? Yes. Thank you for that question. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes, thank you very much. Surah Al Kahf is related to Imam Al Hussein. Salam. In some of the poems, we find that this is often mentioned. Yes. That the Nohas that are recited or the Ladmiyas that are recited in the holy month of Muharram. It's known that there was a priest who looked after the head of Imam Al Hussein. Salam. When the family of Rasulullah were taken as prisoners, from Kufa towards Sham. And he sees one head out of the heads that were being paraded and he wants to have some time with that head. And he himself narrates that when I was washing this head and I saw how beautiful this face was, he said, I heard a voice saying that if you think the companions of the cave were a sign of God's signs, then know that I am the greatest of God's signs. The companions of the cave would have been known by the priests because they are the seven sleepers of Ephesus. And in Christianity, their story was known. Yes. So therefore, that verse of Surah Al-Kahf, of them being a sign of God, was one that was mentioned as a karama, as a miracle for Imam al Hussein alayhi salam with that priest. Mm -hmm. Now we have Sister Rabab from the USA. Salaamu Alaikum. Wa Alaikum Salaam. Yes, welcome to the show. My question is... ...to Rahim towards family members. Now, in Pakistan, there are a lot of women who are honor killed um, due to some decisions of the family members. Now, is it required for those women to practice Salatul Rahim with their family members if their life is in danger? Uh huh. Yes. Yeah, so they're saying in Pakistan there's dangers when you're communicating with family members. Is it still wajib for Zulat al-Rahim to be uh, any act of worship if there is a danger to life or death? If there is a danger to one's life, then priority is that one's life has to be protected. Mm -hmm. If, for example, you know that praying at a certain place in a certain way could cause to your death, then you can pray in a different way. If you know that using, for example, a turba when you're doing sujood could lead to your death, then you can not use the turba. Mm -hmm. Likewise, if you know that Salat al-Rahim will involve the loss of your life, you don't have to observe it there and then. And there are intermediaries who are able to pass on your message towards your relatives to ask how they are. Mm -hmm. uh, a question from Ali Said. Uh, he says, I'm from Canada. He says, uh, is, there more, is there more than one verse for any single verse in the Quran? If so, why is this? I read one verse that has 10 different meanings and derive a new meaning for each time? One word. Or one verse. One word in an eye of the Qur'an can make the difference to what you're thinking is another verse being repeated again and again. A word like min or minhum. When you're looking at the English language, it won't do justice to that ayah. You think you've just read that ayah 65 times. But what you don't realize is that there is only one word that makes a difference to why Allah may say this to this group of people or that to that group of people or this to that context and this in that context. Mm -hmm. So therefore, that's why the Arabic of the Quran has to be studied in depth. Mm -hmm. In the English language, all it says is a repeat of the ayah. But in the Arabic language, one word has a bearing on the whole meaning. Yes, now I have a last call from Brother Ja'far from the U.S. Salaamu Alaikum. Assalamu alaikum, assalamu alaikum, assalamu alaikum, assalamu alaikum, assalamu alaikum, assalamu alaikum, How are you? Uh, I'm calling from USA. I have a question. Um, uh, I've been to a restaurant, the owner is Muslim, 
but he allows BYOB, which is bring your own bottle. Does this money he makes off of that, is it considered halal or haram? Sure, the person is, you said the owner yeah. of the restaurant is a Muslim. But he says yes. that, <laughs> but he allows people to bring their own bottle of wine. Uh -huh. Are you allowed to eat there? Is that the question? I think he hung up. Yes, yes, that's the question. Okay. The ulama are clear. If the alcohol is served on your table, then you're not allowed to sit on a table where alcohol is served. If, however, alcohol is not served on your table, and the owner of the restaurant has made it clear that the restaurant is halal, then it's up to you whether you want to go to that restaurant or not. Mm -hmm. But he has made clear that the food in that restaurant is halal. Mm -hmm. You're not sitting on a table with that bottle. Others are putting a bottle of wine on their table. And the man has taken a step actually further. The man himself could sell alcohol, but he's not. There are Muslims who own restaurants where they sell alcohol. Yes. This man saying, you can bring your own bottle. I've got nothing to do with you. You're sitting on your table. You want to drink it, you could drink it. But as long as the alcohol is not on your table, then it's at your discretion, your belief, and the trustworthiness of the man in his mm -hmm. restaurant. There's no problem. Now we have Sister Maryam from Australia. Salaamu Alaikum. Uh, hi, uh, I just got a question regarding uh, the criteria of being a Sayyid. I'm not sure why children, you know, they do not can or say it if their mom's a Sayyid, given that 50% of their genetic makeup Can you comes repeat that? Mother. Can you just repeat Thank that? Thank you so much. Oh, I'm just wondering why the children are not considered as Sayyid if their mother is Sayyid. If you can repeat it one more time, try to repeat it. Move away from the TV, speak a bit louder. Hello? Yes, yes, you're good now. Your question was? Sorry, did you get my question? No, 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 can you re-say re, re it? Can you re-ask the question? Yeah, I'm wondering why the children are not considered say it if their mother is say it, given that 50% of genetic makeup actually comes from the mother. Aha, uh -huh. so say it from a mother, 50% of them are from the mother's side. Yeah, like, like we said, this is the, the original uh, Sadat begins from Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib and Fatwa Zahra alayhi salam, and then from their sons onwards. Mm -hmm. When it begins with the sons onwards, that's where we get the Sunnah of the Sadat from. Mm -hmm. Sayyidina, I would like to thank you very much uh, for joining us over the past 14 nights. Uh, it was an honor for me. Uh, an honor it's my for, pleasure. Thank an you. honor for, for everyone here uh, who has uh, worked uh, with Sayyid Ammar Naqshwani. Uh, it's a blessing. Uh, but before we go anywhere, uh, just a quick selfie. Uh, and then we can uh, end yeah, our Yeah, we, we'll take the selfie after the show, inshallah. Ha, it will be my pleasure. Uh, great. Um, thank you. Thank so, you. And thank you so much. Yes. And thank, you know, I'd like to thank all the listeners out there um, for joining us. And, you know, many of them have been asking when's the Majalis going to return. Yeah. The Majalis will be back very soon, inshallah. inshallah. I look forward to the holy month of Muharram when inshallah. my Majalis will, will all return, inshallah, with God's, you know, with God's blessings. Hajj Mas'ud, you know, Sheikh Mohammed, yourself, the rest of the team, the camera crew, they've been amazing. Thank you. We've been, you know, honored to be in Aqtaba Abdullah Al Hussein, yes. Shuhada Al Taf. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and allow you all to come soon on the ziyarah of Imam Al Hussein, alayhi salam. Bless you, bless your family, inshallah. You Keep up well. your good work. Inshallah, Sayyidina. You've done very well. Inshallah, Sayyidina. No, it was, it was an honor, and hopefully we can uh, have you once again. Inshallah. Uh, inshallah. So thank you very much. Respect thank viewers, you. thank you very much for tuning in these 14 nights. You guys were amazing. Uh, your comments, your questions were very beneficial. Hopefully we can continue this uh, in the upcoming nights, inshallah, where we have uh, another special guest. But do not forget to tune in and call or send in your names. Uh, to the upcoming show, inshallah, in a few hours uh, with Brother Hassan Sukhni at 5 a.m. Karbala time with Muhammad Ali. You guys can send your salutations uh, to the two kings of Karbala, Imam Hussein. You can call and perform a live ziyara. It's an amazing opportunity. If I were you, I would, you know, keep an alarm and, you know, keep on calling until you get through uh, and then perform a ziyara. Thank you very much for tuning in. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi. Wa barakatuh. Sayyidina.